Well, uh, I guess we'll get started for our robust group here in person. <laughs> we a couple of people, but we have actually quite a few people online, it looks like, coming in. Um, so my name is Jeremy Kenyon. I am uh, officially a research librarian here at the University of Idaho. Um, I'm also the liaison to the College of Natural Resources, and at the moment, I'm also the liaison to the College of Science. Uh, so people in those classes will... Um, yeah, be able to get help from me. And uh, as far as natural resources is concerned, I've been that liaison for about 13 years now. So um, it's been a long time. And I know quite a, a few of the folks and, and can hopefully help them. Um, we're going to talk today about uh, data management uh, specifically. And so what we mean by data management is how do you work with all of those data files and spreadsheets and other things you do in the course of research? Um, what are some tips and uh, lessons that um, best practices that have come out of, of other people working with those and why working with them um, so that you have an idea of how to work with that kind of data um, to hopefully make your life easier and, and do things a little bit better. Um, I worked for about eight years with the U.S. Geological Survey on data management with researchers, uh, so I've talked to a lot of people about these kinds of issues and um, We'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, get this going. There we go. Um, so we're going to talk about that. There'll be plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. And but before we get into that, I want to make a little plug uh, for a library service that we are offering called the Data Hub. And that is, if you're here, it's just right over there in the map room, uh, just around the corner. Uh, if you're online, it's, it's on the first floor, uh, room 107. Uh, we've got individual workstations for people to sit down and work with um, the software that's on the computers there. Um, we're going to get some licensed software that maybe isn't available other places on campus, um, as well as kind of standard things like R and, and Python and, of course, Excel and all that kind of stuff that most people use in the course of their, their data work. Um, and it's also staffed by our GIS librarian, Bruce Godfrey, so if people get into GIS, um, it's one of our sort of uh, key places to go to get help. Uh, if you're struggling with anything, having trouble installing software, you don't know what's available, we've got all sorts of specialized um, kind of add-ons to the software that you may not realize are there. And there's also all sorts of data sets that are available to you you may not realize are there too. So um, 11 to 3 every day, there's somebody working there and they're able to help on there some of the time. So um, yeah, if you, if you have any questions, please come and visit. Uh, there's also a website. And we'll answer your questions over chat if we can. It's, depends on the nature of the question. Sometimes that's kind of hard over chat, but we'll see what we can do. Um, okay, so we're going to go through the seven tips for data management. Um, these are going to be, uh, I think, fairly practical ones. Um, some of this, if you're not working with data right now, might end up being a little theoretical for you. Um, but I, I would say just take some notes, and, and when you get around to it, I think you'll see. Uh, where these things come in handy. Um, <clears throat> number one tip is make sure to back up your data. And uh, that's something that everybody kind of knows and thinks about, but there are so many problems that come out of not backing up your data, whether it's corrupted files, you thought your, your laptop was going to be fine and then suddenly it wasn't one day. Um, it could be other kinds of issues, including things being lost, stolen, uh, making mistakes. So there's a sort of idea of three, two, one as a, a way of thinking about backup. So you want to have three copies of your data. You want to have two on some kind of storage medium. And then you want at least one to be in a physically different place than where you are. And it used to be that this was quite a challenge. Now with cloud uh, uh, storage systems, it's a whole lot easier than it used to be to pull this off. Um, so an example would be you have a copy of your local hard drive on your computer that you're working on. Uh, you maybe have one on the university's OneDrive, which has a pretty robust uh, backup system. There are kinds of, of, of data that you might be working with that are too large or too complex to really fit into this model, and that's fine. Um, but for the vast majority of people, if they're just working with spreadsheets, if they're working in teams um, uh, with fairly simple uh, kinds of data, this is a pretty useful method. Um, the cool thing about yeah, OneDrive and all cloud systems, so Dropbox, Google Drive, all that kind of stuff is if it works for you, that, that does that geographic replication for you. So you don't have to worry about, about that. But if for some reason your computer just exploded, um, there is another copy out there on the cloud, as we said. Um, and then it never hurts to have another copy kind of on a, on a physical media device. 
Um, it used to be that they weren't very robust, but these days they actually last for quite a long time. So, um, you know, backup hard drives, USB drives, things like that. It, it depends. It's something to think about. So you just remember three, two, one, and that's a pretty good way to, uh, to make sure you're, you're backed up and in pretty good shape. Uh, the second tip we're going to talk about is uh, versioning your data. And so um, I'll explain this little diagram here in a second. But um, generally, the idea is you don't really want to modify your raw data, of course. But even as you go, you want to make versions and copies of your data at different stages so you can always go back in case you screw something up uh, intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, and so you can, you can deal with that. So if we look at that picture, it's it's a basic flow chart. Anybody could do this with their project. Um, but you see the, the blue um, uh, parallelograms are uh, data sets, and then the green uh, rectangles there are just, um, uh, just stages in the research. And so in this case, the person is taking some raw data, they're importing it into R. Uh, there's some kind of an internal file format, but you could also create an external data set like a CSV file or an Excel spreadsheet or whatever it is you're working with um, as you go through each of these stages. And what it basically means is if you get to the end and you say, well, okay, that can't possibly be right. I have to go back and fix this. You've got the whole sequence of data available to you. And again, if your data is small, this is really not a problem. If your data is big, these kinds of duplications can be more and more challenging. But typically also, as you go through these stages, you're shrinking essentially what you're working with. You're getting to a more and more uh, uh, detailed and informational, but smaller data set as you go. So yeah, just a, a reminder, you know, just keep copying or, or creating new files as you go. Um, it's a good, good way to protect yourself. Um, one procedure that some people have put out there is if your data isn't that big, you can just literally copy the whole file and then put a put a date on it and then start working with uh or sorry change the name of it and then start working with the new name uh being current and just you do that sequentially as you go and you're always going to have some kind of paper trail of the data that you had in previous stages um there are different kinds of, of um tools that can um, make this process uh, automated but even just copying and pasting a folder will we'll do it um i do also want to point out the uh, uh, paper at the, the bottom of this, uh, Good Enough Practices in Scientific Computing. Um, if you're really interested in, in kind of these data management tips and, and ideas and ways to do better, it's a really good paper that has lots of, of different things that you should take a look at. Uh, it can be really useful. All right, any questions at all so far? Okay. If you have questions online, please throw them in the chat. Uh, and our person here will uh, ask them on your behalf. So. Um, the next step is to use clear and unambiguous data values when possible. So uh, a big part of data management is trying to set up a system when you're working with your data so that at a different stage down the road, whether it's a week or a month or sometimes even a year, you know what you did, you know what things are, you, you know how to make sense of them. We're going to talk about uh, documentation here in a second, but standardizing your data values gets around the documentation uh, need a little bit, although not entirely. And so um, there's a number of things you can do. We'll talk about a couple of different ones, but one of them is just to use identifiers when you can. Um, so in the little table on the screen there, that's just a list of uh, research articles produced by different people, uh, their affiliations, uh, the journal title, and so on. Um, and where possible, we use identifiers to help us just make sense. So the ISSN is the unique identifier of the journal. The DLI is the unique identifier for the article. Uh, and then in the future, or if I have to make this data set interoperable with another data set from some other location, those become uh, fields that I can match on because they're consistent and they're standardized across lots of different fields. Uh, you see this a lot of species names, uh, you see this is language codes. So whenever possible, try to do that kind of thing. Um, if it's too customized, then it becomes really hard to, to know exactly what the data is saying, basically, and what it's about. Um, and never trust your memory either, that you're going to remember down the road, because lots of things are going to happen in your life that it's very easy to forget. 
So um, try to use those clear, standardized, unambiguous data values. Um, specifically, let's talk about variable names um, because these are these are things that once you learn this kind of stuff, then you don't really forget it. Um, but if you've never learned it before, then um, it's easy to make a number of mistakes here. Um, and so these are all examples of, of attribute values or variable names or uh, column headers, if you'd like, um, for different kinds of data. And if you look over on the right, you see a couple of different examples of things you probably shouldn't do. Um, so for example, at the top maximum temp uh, in degree C, and I'll just pick on the people in the room. Can you, do you have any idea why that might be a bad uh, data uh, label or variable name? I always have a hard time finding the degree sign. The so degree like, sign. Repeating that would be maybe kind of Yeah, yeah. It, generally speaking, using those special characters like that is largely unnecessary. As you can see on the left, uh, where it says max temp C, it, it gets to the same point without having to use the special characters. And the more special characters you, do, you use, the more you open yourself up to problems with character encoding as you go from tool to tool or system to system different operating systems, whatever. Somebody says, let me look at your data and they load it up and that throws it off for some reason. Yeah, it just, it creates problems. So to simplify, just using simple alphanumeric characters um, works uh, really, really well. Uh, another one, if we look at M slash F, uh, and then over here in the alternatives, we use uh, sex. And why do you think that is? M slash F is same right and well, maybe not anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Contextually, with that, we kind of know what they're talking about. But without that, we know what M slash F means. You're also using a slash sign, which is a little bit problematic for some systems. So again, you know, think more broadly about what what category of data is this, and come up with a name that works for it. And the last one I'll point out on this um, is the cell type one. Uh, if you my own circle here, cell type. Um, what do you think is the challenge of cell type? It's such a space. Yeah, it's a space. Yeah, for a lot of systems, spaces are problems. Um, and so if you use GIS at all, they actually force you to use underscores or, or something. I guess they don't necessarily force you to use underscores, but something other than a space. They won't let you use space. If you work in a command line interface like with R or Python or any command line, uh, spaces are used to delineate different commands. And so when you have spaces, you have to do a bunch of workarounds for these, these things. So just generally over on the left where you see good name, um, these are all examples. None of them use spaces. Um, all of them are pretty clear and simple, basic alphanumeric characters. Um, so it, it's pretty pretty clean and simple way to think about database. But it'll solve future problems if you do it that way. Um, one other kind of major point is um, think about. Uh, I think a lot of us run into data and spreadsheets where people, if something was blank, they just left it blank. Or sometimes if it was blank, they just put a zero in it. Like, oh yeah, there's nothing here. Here's a zero. So you have to think about your data, and if zero is a valid value, it's not really something that should be in there if it's meant to uh, indicate that there was an absence of data or something like that. So be very clear and, and deliberate about using zeros in the right places at the right times. Um, if you really don't have a value, if there's just missing data, then come up with some convention that works. Um, the you know, common example of things like negative 999 or something like that, that's, if it's just unrealistic for your kind of data, um, like I work in a library, so if it was number of books checked out, nobody's going to have negative 999 books checked out. Um, so that's a good way for us to say this is a this is a negative value or this is an absolute value. Um, if you really get into it and you need to have other kinds of codes, just think about other ways of creating codes using unrealistic values um, that'll make sense for you. Of course, if you do that, then you're going to have to make sure you document that, which is what we're going to get to for our next step here which is um, document what you're doing. And at the very least, especially in the case of tabular data, you wanna use a data dictionary or a code book um, 
different kinds of data are going to have different kinds of metadata that you can associate with them. Um, this is a really simple version that works for anything in a table. Uh, and the majority, it seems, of data that's out there tends to be in a tabular structure or a grid structure. Um, and so this works. And as you can see, it's not complicated either. Um, you really want to give the variable name, uh, very similar to what we were looking at a couple slides ago. And then you want to put whatever information you need in order to interpret it. Um, so in the case of, of sex on this one, number four, um, they, they lay out what the M and the F stand for, as well as potentially this other category is not determined. And so um, you can you can write this this kind of thing almost any way you want. There's not really a standard <laughs> specifically for data dictionaries and code books. Um, however, lots of fields do have metadata standards, um, and they actually will spell out how to how to put a code book into their particular uh, structure. Um, if you've worked with GIS data at all, you'll know that documentation isn't just uh, attribute values or feature values, but it's also the map projection system and the coordinate reference system. If you're going to project that data on a map at some point, you need to say what kind of projection you use in the first place. Otherwise, people can't uh, comfortably say, yes, for sure, this is the way the data should be represented on a map. So at the very least, if you're not doing anything else, just create a data dictionary that records what it is that you uh, put into your table. Uh, here's some more examples of things you could put in there. Um, Min-max values, uh, issues, relationships, different things. Um, if you're using a, a standard um, set of terms from some source, put the source in here. Uh, just let people know where it came from. So pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, any questions at all? Yes. Um, yeah. One question is, seeing data and lots of or these data dictionaries in lots of different ways, sometimes they're kind of a separate sheet if you're working with Excel, like in that same yes. set with the data, or sometimes it's a completely separate file. Is there a preference or is there a better way? Is, is there one way you should be? I think when you're working with it, um, it's a little bit of whatever works. So it's easier for you to create a separate sheet uh, because you know you're going to be in Excel and you're only working in Excel. <laughs> That's how Excel works. Um, but if you're if you're creating CSV files to be read into R or Python or or something like that, I would say create a data dictionary in a second file. Um, just there's no reason why you can't, and then you just want to keep those files together in the folder somewhere. So it's like, here's the data, and then if you have questions, here's the, the documentation. Um, and that also allows them to be read into those, those programs. And some of those programs have uh, libraries that will actually generate these kind of uh, data dictionaries off of the data sets. So you can do it from R if you wanted to, I guess. Okay. Um, if you have familiarity with R, then you're used to the conversation about tidy or messy data. Um, if you're not, um, and surprisingly, a lot of people are not familiar with this, um, just kind of be mindful of the different types of formats that you can you can arrange your data in. Um, the, the one on the, the left, for those of us in person, um, this table over here, um, follows what's called a wide format. And that's really good for human consumption because when we look at it, you and I, like assuming you're an English speaker, uh, you can see what's going on pretty well. You can see the, the pattern across the different years, different locations. When you look on the one on the on the, the right, the long or the tidy data, it actually is kind of hard to read as a as a human being, just to like look through and see what the comparative difference is. You really have to stare at it for a while. Problem is machines really like the one on the right. Um, if you're creating a visualization in Tableau or you're processing things in R or you're uh, creating a, uh, an attribute table for a GIS data set, um, the long format is preferred because it, it actually just makes it simpler for every uh, column is a different variable and every row is a different observation. And that's just easier to process. Uh, as it seems, uh, you can just go record by record and then use that data appropriately. The other one is is aggregated essentially for people. Um, 
it's actually pretty easy to do this, although it takes a little bit of practice if you use these different systems. And if you work enough with data, I would recommend uh, exploring these um, as tools to do so. Um, but in, in both R and Python, there's some very simple um, commands that you just have to learn how to use that allow you to basically flip back and forth between long and wide formats, depending on your purpose and what it is you're trying to do. So, um, yeah, and then as I say at the bottom, there's other features and other applications that let you kind of reshape the data as well. So, um, yeah, think about that. If you're running into problems, say, is my data tidy? Is it not? Um, or if I'm going to show this to people, should I maybe flip it into a different format? Um, the next tip we're going to talk about is date time formats specifically. Um, and part of the problem, as you can see in a little example here, is that many of us, if Excel is the primary thing we've used, we're really used to the crazy and weird ways that Excel sometimes handles dates. Uh, <laughs> it turns yeah, like this last one that turns everything into numbers at times. And it's it's just confusing and weird. Um, but there is a international standard for how to represent dates and times in um, this kind of a system. And it's kind of referred to as ISO 8601. So it's an international standards organization standard. Um, and it's, uh, as you see there, it's year, month, date. And then there's some other uh, aspects of it for time as well. So you can create a pretty much a universal date time stamp. And the, the reason for doing this is that, as it says at the bottom, tools are often built to understand this format. So if you put your date times into the structure, and it doesn't matter what your tool is. Um, I haven't seen one yet that doesn't know how to read an ISO 8601 date time. Um, and so then it knows, okay, this is a date. And so it gives you whatever features it's supposed to give you for dates. Um, or, um, and you can derive columns uh, for like months or days from this. Um, so this is a good kind of baseline way to store your data time data. And then as you go, you might have to create derivatives uh, as you go, but but there's no reason not to do this basically, mm -hmm. at least at the at the sort of uh, the rawest form out of your data. Um, Tip number seven is assume others will see your data at some point. And so when you're in school, that's pretty common, actually. Your, your team members might see it, your instructor or advisor might see it. Um, when you go out into the world, or in the case of some of uh, our, our researchers and scientists, the tradition for a long time was that, you know, you do your work and you generate your publication or you go to a conference and do a presentation, whatever. And nobody actually sees the underlying data. They just see what you share. Um, in the age of data publishing, sharing, reproducibility, open science, like people are going to look at your data. Um, and if they're not going to look at it directly, they're going to ask you for it. And so when they do that, you're going to want to think about all these things that we've just talked about. Is it well documented? Is it clear? Is it standardized? Um, have I gone through and, and just made it as accessible as possible and, and readable as possible? Um, funders require data sharing. Journals expect data sharing. Just the other day, there's a, a new memo from the White House that instructed every federal agency to come up with um, public access plans for data and publications for everything they find. So every researcher everywhere gets a federal grant is going to be running into this over the next few years, um, if they haven't already, and many have. Um, so a good way to deal with the anxiety or fear that comes from, um, like, I'm, I'm worried about people seeing my dirty laundry, so to speak is to make sure you're doing the best you can with um, the data that you have. Um, and if you just assume, yeah, people are going to see this, then you should be in pretty good shape. Uh, yeah, so here's an example um, that I, I, I found. Uh, this is just uh, in a medical journal where people were talking about meta-analyses tied to that ivermectin uh, drug that people were talking about as a possible uh, way to deal with COVID. My point, on this was simply that um, these people are investigating this issue and they're going to the authors and they're saying, you did a study on this, let me see what you did, because it's a big deal and, and we want to know. Um, and there's actually a, a recent study uh, on data availability statements where people publish and then they say, like, this is how you can get my data. And it showed that 
it's very hard to get people's data. <laughs> Actually, people don't want to share it. Um, they're not comfortable with it. And I think some of it, there, there are a variety of reasons, but some of it is just the sense of, I don't want people looking at the state that it's in. We we did our work, we put our research out there, that should be good enough. And it, it often isn't, um, especially if you want to identify potential errors or problems. Uh, so that was that was the seven tips. Um, I'm going to throw in a bonus tip because I remembered it at the beginning of the meeting and I should have put that in there. Um, and can you see this screen on? You can, okay. Um, one more is this uh, bulk rename utility, which is a, a free uh, file. Oh, I can see that. Oh, we can't see that. Yeah. Let me just share the screen here. Um, there we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this bulk rename utility, which comes from the UK uh, web address, it is a brilliant tool if you need to rename a huge like load of files. So if you have just 100 files and you want to kind of take up a, a best practice of a naming convention that your team came up with or something that you saw somewhere, um, like using dates at the beginning of your files or something, um, you can just choose. You can do it any way you want, basically. It's got an immense amount of features and it's it's a really cool uh, tool. So I would recommend that. A lot of people, uh, whenever I point this out, whenever they use it, they say like, this is the best part of the whole thing with this thing. So just know about that. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, definitely rename your files using that if you can. But otherwise, yeah, think through these things. Make sure things are backed up. Version your data. Be intentional with your data values, so clear and ambiguous data values. Please use the data dictionary or code books and document what you've done. Um, think about the, the, the data format that you're using, particularly if it's tabular, um, and whether that's used purpose. Uh, use standardized date time formats, which you say date, not data, and assume others will see it. And that's just gonna it's gonna help you if you're writing a thesis or a dissertation, it's gonna help you if you're publishing. Um, it's a good way to go. So that was the, those were my tips. <laughs> and so um, if people have questions, I'm right, more than happy uh, to answer them. Um, that's just the list of the upcoming uh, sessions, but I'm um, happy to answer any questions that uh, people have on chat or here in person. Yeah, thank you.